morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about DNA. Topic for the day is going to be bacterial gene expression, more specifically talking about operons. And it's been a while since I've made a video, so let's hope this goes all right today. First and foremost, we have our objectives. These are, these are the things that I need you to know or be able to do by the end of this video. So first thing, Explain the need for gene regulation. So why do we need to do it in the first place? Second, understand the concept of an operon. Third, compare and contrast reducible, repressible, and inducible operons. I said this might be a tough one. So before I stumble over any more words, let's go ahead and get going. So first of all, why do we need to control gene expression? Now remember that the expression of a gene is just, you know, that DNA being transcribed and translated into proteins. Thing is, your body may or may not need to make a protein at any given time. The example that we're going to use throughout this video is the bacteria E. coli because its regulation pathways have been really well studied. So in the case of E. coli, one of the pathways we're going to talk about a lot deals with an amino acid called tryptophan. When your E. coli culture that's living in your gut has tryptophan present, so let's say it's Thanksgiving, you've just eaten a bunch of turkey, your body is full of tryptophan, that E. coli doesn't need to waste energy making the amino acid tryptophan. It can just absorb it from, its, from your body. So in that case, it would want to shut off the genes that are responsible for synthesizing tryptophan. But then let's say, you know, it's midsummer, you haven't eaten turkey for a while, haven't eaten anything else with tryptophan, that E. coli in your gut is going to need to make tryptophan, so it would turn on the genes needed to synthesize that amino acid. whole point of that is to save energy. That E. coli doesn't want to be wasting energy making tryptophan if it doesn't need to. All right, as far as control goes, two basic models, feedback inhibition versus gene regulation. We've talked about feedback inhibition. That would be, if I can show you here using a little diagram, um, we've talked about metabolic pathways. That's any essentially chemical pathway in your body. Two ways you could go. We've got an enzyme pathway right here. So one option would be where the enzyme goes down and enzyme activity is regulated. So let's say the end product right here goes down and shuts off this enzyme. If that's the case, then the enzyme shut down and the pathway doesn't go anymore. The other way this could happen is the product could go down and you could actually shut off one of the genes that makes this enzyme. If you shut off the gene, you don't get the enzyme. Same effect, your pathway is shut down. So just know feedback inhibition is where an end product goes back and shuts down one of the first steps, and that can be done by either shutting down the enzyme itself or shutting down the gene that makes the enzyme. All right, let's get into the meat of our discussion for the day. Um, an operon. This is essentially a model for how your body or, well, I guess we're talking about E. coli today. So an operon is essentially a model for how E. coli regulate whether a gene is going to be expressed or not. Remember when a gene is expressed, then the proteins that are associated with it are made. On our genetic material in your DNA, there are units called transcription units. And what a transcription unit is, is it is all of the sequences needed to make each of the polypeptide chains in a protein. So let's say that we have got our strand of mRNA right there. This mRNA strand could be in three different sections. Each one of those sections might have the instructions for one polypeptide chain. So that is for chain A, chain B, and chain C. It's possible that whatever protein is being made is composed of these three chains all folded and wound together. So rather than having them spaced out in like gene A over in one part of the DNA and gene B over here and gene C in a third place, what happens with the genetic material is you've got one promoter. Remember, a promoter is the place that polymerase binds to go ahead and start transcribing your DNA. Um, you've got one promoter and then a string that has got all of your instructions for making the polypeptide chains. Each of those strings, remember, when we talked about transcription, there is a start and a stop codon. So as this polymerase cruises down the line, it just reads these off. And when it hits a start, it'll start. Boom, read off, make that chain, it hits the stop, that chain breaks off and hangs out until the next one is made. So transcription unit, just know it is one promoter and all of the genes needed to make a functioning protein. All right, 
the best way to talk about the idea of an operon is simply by example. There are going to be two examples we're going to talk about today. One is tryptophan, the other one is lactase, or uh, yeah, it has to deal with lactose. Um, both of these are in E. coli. So the first one we're going to talk about is the tryptophan, I guess, operon. An operon is essentially the uh, set of enzymes and materials that work together to control whether a gene is transcribed or not. So in our E. coli, we just talked about how if tryptophan is present, then it doesn't want to spend the energy to make tryptophan. So what you're looking at here is you've got this first part right here. This would be the operon. That is the section of the gene that controls whether, you know, the gene is actually being transcribed or not. And then right here are all of the genes that are needed to make a working tryptophan molecule. So what's going to go on is if you have got tryptophan present in the body, that tryptophan is going to bind with a protein called a repressor. What that repressor does is the repressor comes and it binds onto the promoter and once that repressor is there, polymerase can no longer bind to carry out transcription. So it essentially acts like a roadblock. Generally, when tryptophan is not around, this repressor is not here and um, polymerase can bind all day long, cruising down here, making everything that is needed to synthesize tryptophan. But when tryptophan is around, your body doesn't, or the E. coli doesn't want to waste the energy making that tryptophan. So the tryptophan binds to our repressor, which causes it to turn into this active form that can shut down this pathway, shuts down the pathway, and it doesn't work anymore. This is an example of allosteric inhibition, where our repressor flips between an on state, which might look something like this, where it can bind to the, re to the repressor right there, or an off state where it doesn't necessarily fit. And when the tryptophan binds, it's gonna lock it into that on position to where it can actually bind down there and stop the process from happening. All right, this kind of pathway is known as a repressible operon because it is usually off, but when tryptophan is present, it will shut that down. It will repress the pathway. So no, a repressible operon is a pathway that is usually on, but when the molecule that's being made is present, it shuts down the pathway so that you don't waste energy um, making whatever needs to be made. The opposite of a repressible operon is an inducible operon. And an inducible operon is one that is usually off, but then when something needs to be made, the pathway is turned on so that that thing can be synthesized. The example we're going to use of this is the LAC operon, which produces the enzymes needed to break down the sugar lactose. All right, so usually this operon is not on, but when your body has lactose in it, obviously it needs the enzymes to break down that lactose, so the pathway would be turned on. It would be induced so that the enzymes can be made that are needed to break down lactose. And this is what that pathway looks like. So unlike a repressible pathway that is usually on, this one would be typically off. Now this diagram isn't showing you very well what it would look like, but in a normal state your repressor right here would be hooked up right here. Okay, so this would be normal state right there, which means that the RNA polymerase cannot really do anything because this is usually shut down. However, when you have got lactose present, that lactose binds to the repressor, which makes it inactive. You can see that this will no longer fit in there. So when this repressor is inactive, RNA polymerase can bind and produce that uh, enzyme that is needed to break down lactose all day long. So just know inducible operons are usually turned off, but then the presence of some chemical can turn them on and start that process rolling. And then obviously once we have got plenty of the enzyme present, the amount of lactose in the body is going to go down, which means that this pathway is then going to go back to its normal state. And with that, I am going to go ahead and finish up for the day. I hope you were able to follow all that. I know a lot of confusing words and terms and diagrams and stuff. If you got questions, ask me in class. Thank you for joining us. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.